uh, you know, I'm sure his family was well taken care of financially. And some people think that's the way out, I guess. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, well, it's you a know, now, tragedy. Yeah. Now, let me add into this because I've, I've really been scouring. There are a couple of people off the record who say that financially he was also under pressure. That he had these very expensive divorce settlements, and he had, by losing the CBS show, he wasn't going to start earning again until the end of this year. Hello? Are you there? Yeah, I lost you for a minute. Okay, good. I got you back. So in other words, he was yeah. under some financial pressure. Now, they played a, an interview with him, with Mark Marin. And he mentioned suicide. He came right out and talked about the subject with Marin. He was spot on the, the subject. And he said like this. He said, um, you know, he says, I got money problems. He goes, I'm not working right now. And he says, uh, you know, it does get dark. And he says, well, what about suicide? He goes, nah. He goes, I don't have the balls. So this is years. But, right. So this is what I'm, I'm very interested in. My angle on this guy was devastating to me because any human being who is trying to settle themselves in their head, whatever your child or whatever your DNA is, usually some kind of success will give you the resources to be able to. So if his thing was what we're learning it was. That's what's the most frightening part. Is it possible that even in 2014 we do everything, the internet, blah, 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 we can't arrest a a suicide as it's happening? Like in slow motion, it can't be seen. It's still under the radar. I mean, what did he have to do? He rang every alarm bell, and he was known for struggles. And then if this happens, that's, that's what's been bothering me. What's your thought on the inevitability no matter who you are, you know, Hemingway, a shotgun. Well, listen, if somebody wants to do it, if somebody wants to do it, they're going to do it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There are guys that have attempted, quote unquote, attempted suicide 10 times. Right. Well, if you attempted suicide 10 times, you really don't want to kill yourself. You know, anybody that really wants to do it can do it. And, uh, and I think, you know, if he struggled with it and he went to the dark place that one day in a really dark place... You know, uh, he lost his battle, clearly. Uh, you know, uh, as far as him being financial, uh, having financial problems, I'm sure to the average person, they're just going to go, you know, yeah, right. You know, the guys made, guys had over 100 film roles. Mm-hmm. So he had to make millions and millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. Now, whether he had bad settlements and, you know, hey, look, sell your house, okay? Buy a smaller house. That'll be the end of your, your financial problems, really. Well, you know, and then what do you think he did? That 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 last show he did. He did it for money. He, sure, he must. He, he did, did it, it for, for money. money. He sure. did it for. He said it. He said it. And that's see. Here's where I'm going with this. Is there a level of humiliation for a household name, a global friend? Every kid laughs. Everybody likes some kind of thing. When that it comes crumbling down, is that a, a level of humiliation? It, it, it could be beyond him as well. To be then known as the, oh, yeah, you heard about Robin Williams? Yeah. He could immediately envision tabloids and, you know, cameras and the, com- I mean, everybody loves yeah, a decline. It's not like he was working in Burger King. I mean, he had a, he had an hour show on CBS, which he was probably being paid millions per season. And the show, uh, granted, I never saw it. Uh, I've heard that it wasn't very good. And uh, they, they certainly loaded it up. They put... Uh, uh, Michelle, um, what's her name? Sarah Michelle Geller. Sarah Michelle Geller and uh, Dauber. They put in Dauber for the reunion factor. The people who love more. You know, they yeah. they yeah. they put right. in the people that were, you know, that were going to bring in the numbers, or they thought would bring in the numbers. But right. it was just maybe a bad concept for him. I don't think that that's. I don't think I would have put him in a suit. You know, for one, I, it was horrible. I yeah, I saw office. it. I saw the whole thing. I, I would have put him in. I would have put him in. You know, I would have had him as a crazy dock worker, or you know what I mean. I would have went with more traditional kind of, uh, you know, uh, family sitcom honeymooners type thing than try to put him in some high concept thing that's not going to make sense. You know, put him or in you know what have been funny? I tell you, most people can't relate to that. Exactly. No, exactly. You know what have been funny? Honestly, yeah. when you think of, if you're thinking about what kind of show should he do to like be a hit, if you just wanted to make a hit for him, you say, why don't you yeah. do when Mork gets older? 
and that he's and he's no different. He just has an old face. He has a, he has aged. But uh, jump you know, in. I would have gave him. A, I would have gave him a half an hour variety show and base it on the Jonathan Winter show. Right. That, that's Where another. He comes right. out in front of an audience and he pulls Does what stuff he out of a bag and yeah. you know. You that, got that's it. That's the genius. Go. That's it. That's it. All right, you so know, now I want to go to uh, another angle. Let's switch angles now. He's in a marriage, third marriage, okay? So that means this woman knows every legend about him. There's, you know, if you follow the paper, he's got enough problems. If you're married to him, I'm sure there's twice as many. So you know what you're in, soon into this marriage. What does it suggest to you that he would get away with this in the house with between the slashing his wrist that didn't work, you know, this this he made superficial cuts and he realized that he didn't want to go that way. Mm-hmm. This and then she leaves without a look in on he's, you know, acting the way he's at, you know, withdrawn or whatever, you know, all of this in the mix. What does that suggest to you? Do you think he was so dark that this is the kind of, you know, a household that are like, look, I'm not going to go over there, open the door, I'm going to feel worse. He'll come out when he's ready. Or, or he was so deliberately quiet that he wanted to sneak it by. He was like, you know, the last thing I want is well, her. You know what I mean? Like, I don't get that. If you've ever lived with somebody that suffers from depression, and I have for many years, but with somebody who's suffering from depression. And after a while, you just get fed up with it. You're like, don't do it already. You know, because it it basically kills you a little bit every day. It's very, very difficult to live in there. And people will say, oh, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? You try it sometime. You know what I mean? For a person living with somebody who's like that, he, I'm sure he wasn't the funny guy when he was at home. If he suffered from depression, people that suffer from depression, I, and I know a lot of people that suffer from depression, I have a very good friend that's, that you know also that suffers from depression. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, I lived with somebody for many years that right. suffered from depression, and it's very, very difficult to do it. And you throw your hands up after a while. That's you say, what oh, that's right. I can't. Yeah. You know what, I'm going out to the mall and go to a movie because exactly. I need to clear my brain. Because you and can't go into... He does what right. he does, that's it. You can't go into their darkness every day with them because they're in no, that no. darkness relentlessly. And then when they come out of it, you never know when they're going back in. They're like, oh, wow, they're okay well, now. You know, and everybody suffers from depression. It's not, like, it's not exclusive. I mean, everybody gets it. I get it, but I come out of it fairly quickly. You know what I mean? I have, I have real bad days and when things go bad and, you know, I had my share of things in, the, in recent years and you go through a divorce and you go through these things and, you know, financial problems and you really just sit there and go, you know, but then, you know, you just figure, oh, what the hell with it? You know, I'm just going to go live in, a, in, a, in my car and start over. If that's what it comes down to, and uh, you know, it depends on how you. Uh, that's how my DNA is. But if your DNA, if you don't have that thing that's telling you, hey, it's okay, you know, there's a light. If you don't see the light, you know, it's it's bad. And for for a guy like him with his enormous talent, I mean, the enormous body of work that he's done, and the, the incredible acting, the, the stand up, the voice work in the, in the cartoons, uh, the Disney cartoons. I mean. Uh, the guy's done everything. He's been a best-selling, uh, you know, he's had best-selling albums, movies, television. He's been successful in everything he do, it does. And then on top of it, over the last few years, his very, very close friends, Christopher, uh, Christopher Reeve, he was very close with their roommates. He died, you know, had suffered terribly. And then Jonathan Winters passing away recently, who was his idol, who was one of his best friends. So, I mean, that's kind of take its toll. You know, and if you're 63 years old and you see yourself as having Parkinson's and now my kids are going to have to see me shaking and, and, and all this stuff like that, maybe he just said, you know what, I, I can't do this. Well, you know what, I, I, I thought that. Now another angle that hit me like a ton of bricks, all right, because if you're watching this, you know, like we do with the show, we follow the unfolding of the story. I guess it was day two, this adorable daughter of his, maybe you already know the story I'm about to tell, she does a sweet tweet about losing him. You know, um, the, it's going to be tough, but I'll always look up in the sky. So many, It was beautiful, heartfelt. Well, these a-holes on Twitter attacked her. Maybe you're the reason he did it. Maybe, they hurt her so bad yeah, she, she, had to jump, she had to jump off the Twitter. So my question was going to be, what do you think that's like to be the kid of a guy? No one knows these kids from Adam. 
you know, I mean, they're kids. I mean, I'm talking about not age-wise, they're, they're young adults. But, I mean, they're completely unknown and now to get pummeled like that, that's what I was asking you, if that's a, a, how that strikes you for the, uh, the era that we're in. Or this always would have went on, but Twitter just lets her hear them. I mean, nobody would say anything to, to Sean Lennon. Because of the because of the immediacy of social media stuff, particularly if you're a celebrity and you're bringing up your kids and the whole guy, you have to sit down and talk to them and say, listen, there are trolls on the Internet. And they don't do anything except put out negativity. They don't like anything. They've never done anything in their life. They've never done anything constructive with their life. And all they sit and do is take pot shots from their from their bedroom, from their TV. And, you know, they live in the mother's basement. You know, these are guys that have never done a thing in their life. And all they want to do is say, oh, Robin Williams, the latest thing was this, and, and then he did this. And, or, you know, in any form, you put anything out there, there will be people that will put stuff out negatively. So when you're going to have something like this, you're going to get these little weirdos, these little creeps, that if you if they, they wouldn't have the balls to say it to you face-to-face. Right. You know, so they're going to go and they're going to go pick on a little girl. Imagine so, that. You know, so Imagine you, that. I mean, it just kills it comes me. From. Kills me. All right, now let's get out of the negatives. Let's get on the other side of this guy. Um, were you, I'm guessing, since you're Mr. Pop Culture, there's no way that you weren't around when he popped on the scene in Happy Days, either by accident sure. or you read it in the paper, the TV guide. So try well, to. Re- I saw him when he was on Happy Days. I remember it. Go ahead. So, what was your first impression? How old were you? Uh, Ish. Well, Ish. Happy Days was what, 20, 76, 77, something like that? College. So, I was 20 years old. 20 years. All right, good. So what is... Uh, I mean, Happy Days was popular, and I liked it. You know, I wasn't crazy about it, but it was, you know, it was okay. It was the number one show in America. And honestly, I remember him on the show, coming on the show. I didn't really think too much about it one way or the other. I wasn't, like, wowed by the character. What what did it for me was right after he got his... They gave him his own... He was on Happy Days a couple of times, and they gave him a series, because everybody that was on Happy Days got a series. And the only thing is that his last... You know, there were several other ones. There was one called Blansky's Beauties, you know, which was like, uh, what's her name? The old lady that was on the show playing the cleaner or something. You know, everybody was, you know, Laverne Shirley and right. Lenny and Squeaky. Everybody got a show. Right, right. So, so the thing was, his show lasted. Mm-hmm. And he kind of did what his own thing with the end because he he actually brought in Jonathan Winters at the end to play his son who had aged or something weird or whatever. Right. And right. Honestly, I didn't follow the show. I saw it a few times. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he had a lot of talented people on the show. But I saw him on a, like an HBO special doing stand-up. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, and then I saw him on Johnny Carson, and he came out with an album called Reality. What a concept. Right. He was like Casablanca Records. That was a big And uh, uh, he blew my mind, I and mean, he's doing uh, uh, an imitation of Springsteen's song Fire, and he's doing it by, but Elma Fudd is singing it. Good driving in my car. Yeah, exactly. Going right. on the way to you. Right. I mean, I just thought this guy, and, and, and there's so much, talk about pop culture, there's so much, there's so much stuff in there. It's like, oh, you don't like that joke? Wait a second, here comes another one. You know, the stuff is just uh, unbelievably, uh, you know, uh, funny. And then on top of it, the guy goes and makes a couple of movies. They say, wow, this thing, this guy can act. Right, and right. You see him in Moscow and the Hudson. Oh, uh, wasn't when that great? In, when he goes yeah, into the that. supermarket for the first time and sees the rolls of toilet paper and paper towels, <laughs> and he faints. <laughs> and you know how many people that were immigrants have told me that story? Right. I mean, it was so so real, you know, mm-hmm. the stuff that he did, and and uh, just a, you know, I'm, I'm a big part of my kids' life growing up because he did a lot of movies that my kids watched over and over again: Jumanji, Aladdin, um, Mrs. Doubtfire. My son still watches Mrs. Doubtfire, and he's a man, you know. So uh, uh, all of these, all of the uh, hook. You know, all, this was a big era. If you were a kid growing up in the 80s and 90s, you you saw Robin Lee, Popeye. Right. You know? Right. You know, I mean, a really flawed movie, but what's great about Popeye is his Popeye. I mean, his Popeye, is, that was his first movie. And I, I went to see it in the theaters, and I thought, 
okay, it's Robert Altman. So, you know, it's one of these things everybody talks. It's supposed to be like real life. Everybody talks over each other and stuff like that. But, right, right. And some of the songs were pretty bad, but he was amazing. And at the last half hour of that movie, if you if you have a chance, I think it's on Netflix. As a matter of fact, Netflix just put up a whole bunch of Robin Williams movies. I, you know what? I'm sure they did because I saw a bunch last night were on the cable. I, they're going to start playing them all over the place. Yeah, I'll watch well, it. I will it, watch it. I will it, watch it again. Watch the yeah. last half hour. It's a, right. The last half hour is a great Popeye cartoon where he fights Pluto in the, in the middle of this, uh, like, um, little lagoon. Mm-hmm. And that whole last half hour is great. The rest of the movie is pretty painful to go through. And he also based it on the early comic strip, which most people weren't familiar with. They were familiar with Popeye and the cartoons. He went to the he went to Thimble Theater, and that's how he tried to make the movie. But what's, it's a very flawed movie, but what's amazing about it is his Popeye is dead on, like he walked off the comic strip page. Wow. You know, absolutely brilliant version of it. You know, and then he's made, you know, he made a lot of bad movies, there's no question about that. He's done these, he's doing the, the, I just saw the trailer uh, last week for the Night of the Museum 3, and he plays Teddy Roosevelt, which he does a great job at, you know, the movies aren't that great, but he does a great character in the movies, mm-hmm. you know, and he doesn't mm-hmm. carry the movie, he's a small, he's, but, I mean, he's made so many really, uh, Great films, you know, Goodwill Hunting, uh, you know, I mean, just uh, amazing stuff. You, you know, know, you know which one day. I used to love to watch, and I don't think I've seen it in ten years, but I used to watch it a lot. Did you ever see The World According to Garp? Sure. Yeah, I, but I used to rent it for some reason. It used to be in the video store back in the VHS days. I used to always grab right. that because it, it was it was a very trippy movie. There was a lot going on, but I thought. That made him to me a legit actor. I was like, well, you know, that's that's like real acting. That was a very. Well, that was one of his early movies, and you know that bit where they play the game, where they turn off the lights in the car. I mean, people really do that. If you live in a rural area, if you live in Long Island, or you live in Dutchess County, sure, kids do that. That's a real thing. No, we did you that. Know, so, I did I that. Mean, yeah. 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 Oh, well, we all have. So the thing is, uh, you know, he was just he was just a really. Uh, Really great actor. I mean, he had the, the, the what's that one? The Fisher King. Oh man, he was uh, terrific in that, right? Know, right. He's he's amazing in type. He, uh, oh, the, and and uh, the one that's great. Uh, where he plays the killer. A one hour photo. Oh, I love. You know what? It was just on two weeks ago. I watched it. I saw it in the movie theater, and it came yeah. out. in that one came out in tandem. He released two movies in one season. It came out in tandem with Insomnia. Which right. we, which he, he where he played a, both we played a killer and both and he was great in both. Of them. Oh my god! By the end of Insomnia, I swear to God, he was he had you all freaked out, and you're like, it's it's Robin Williams. You didn't care. You were like, Robin Williams has lost his mind, and he's a mad killer. It was really good. One hour photo. Well, he's, so in, he's so into one hour photo. He's so into that character. The character. So oh creepy. my god! And then the w- when they pull back and you see all those pictures on the wall. I mean, you aren't thinking, you're not expecting that. You, you know something's trippy, but that was still deep into that movie. You're like, oh, my God. So, yeah. And then when he gets, I mean, I, to me, that's what's great. But now I'm going to ask you a question tied into this. Because he's so superlative and because he rides on whether it's loud intensity in his comedy or it's quiet but sizzling intensity in these films as killers and, you know, in the down low. It, does it follow that anybody who's that intense for 45 years in the public eye, from Juilliard right up to his last thing he did, is it impossible to be well-balanced? I mean, could he really be okay and rev that engine because it's it, it's so talented, it you know it, it takes more fuel. He's getting everything right. He's not just attempting things. He's executing. He's getting rewarded. He's reaching higher. He's get, is that inevitably you got to get banged up? Is there a normal way to experience his kind of talent and success? Uh, one celebrity again, I won't name who, said to me one time when I talked about his career. He said to me. Whatever burns white hot has a natural half life. Boom, boom. See now, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Uh, I I think to a certain extent, I don't think you can maintain. I don't think anybody can maintain. I mean, I think the Beatles are thought really highly of because their career was like seven years. 
you know, they walked away from being the Beatles in 1970. Right. So they never got to the point where, you know, like, let's say the Rolling Stones were, where there were some of those albums, you just say, why did they bother to show up? And in a lot of cases, they didn't. They just put their name on it. And you know? now back to him, he does I mentioned this to somebody else. He doesn't have a lot of bad work. Robin Williams' career no, is he, not he clogged had a, he up. He had a few there that you said he did for the paycheck, like a RV few, comes a few, to mind. A few, a few, but I'm saying if you look at his performances, even you said Popeye was was um, negatively reviewed, but his performance, it was excellent. Well, yeah, and I think that, I, you know, that was, a, that was an A movie. I mean, that was a big budget movie. They spent a lot of money on that, so that wasn't really like, you know, doing Robert. You know, you were working for Robert Altman, and you and you're going to be Popeye. So I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't fall that into that category. But he did some some pedestrian type sitcommy kind of things. There was one there with Kurt Russell where they were reliving their football years or something. I can't remember the name of it. But there were, there were a few there where you go, you went, okay, you know. But, you know, also I think it's the mentality that I, I heard Beth Midler say this one time. You know, they, they they said, you know, you did The Rose, it was so great, and then you did all these really crappy movies. What's up with that? She goes, I want to be like the old actors who made five movies a year because when I'm dead, I got a better chance of doing 10 good ones <laughs> if right. I made 100 movies. Good for her. So you know, you, I don't yeah. want to wait five years in between movies like Dustin Hoffman. You want now, to get up to battle. He's trying to make up for lost time. Exactly. If you, you, know, if you like and it. he's doing yeah. crap. Yeah. Right. I hear you. You know, yeah. if, you, if you like hitting home runs, you got to keep coming to play every day. If you like I mean, the Robin experience, Williams, yeah. Robin Williams had 101 film roles. Yeah. That's a lot of movies. In, in, what are we talking Thirty-five years, right? You know, yeah. I mean, to me, it's it's a fun. To me, I thought his productivity, along with his success rate, would be two of the highest in show business. If you're going to do that many movies, if you're going to have that short a career, if you're going to go racing into Juilliard and get a two person class with John Houseman, I mean, you know, John Houseman wasn't going to waste his time. So he got, it's like when Jeter gets to the Yankees, you know, you get someplace where people succeed and you're a high powered, unique talent. So that's what I guess, you know, I'm asking, like if you rev that engine and you have that kind of work ethic, you got a huge body of work and you have still a relatively low failure rate. I mean, you'd agree with that, right? I mean, I'm not saying he never failed, but his failure oh, rate. Oh, no, I think, you know, I think his body of work is superlative. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, he was roommates and best buddies with Christopher Reeve. And Christopher Reeve was perceived as a serious actor, you know, aside from playing Superman. Right. But the fact of the matter is, Christopher Reeve, Reeve couldn't wash his windows. You know what I'm saying? Never had the depth as an actor no. that that you know you you watch uh, uh, you know, Good Will Hunting, you know, or or when he's at his best, you know, uh, The Awakening. Right. You know, that's so, one. That's but there's stuff going thing. on in his right. eyes. Right. You know that that Christopher Reeve. You know, no offense, but really couldn't touch him as an actor, and and yet Christopher Reeve was perceived. I mean, Robin Williams for the most part was perceived as a comedian, right? You know, a funny guy. Yeah. You know, because he's done a lot of funny stuff, but he also did a great. I mean, he was a great film actor. He knew how to work the medium. He knew how to. You know, he he's, his characters were, you know, just because he when he did his stand up, he was over the top. He he didn't act like that. He wasn't William Shatner, <laughs> right? You know, right. that's right. You know, he didn't overact no. one iota. No, you know, not in the roles that you know that that called for it. You know, sure, he had the wacky stuff. You know, uh, roles. Well, you know, stuff, we didn't but, talk about it yet, so let's mention it and see what you think of it. What's your thought about Dead Poets? Is that a favorite? Is it one you saw once? Is it uh, what kind of impression did uh, Dead Poets? Well, it's another one that you know. Again, early in his career, that people just went, "Wow, you know, this guy really—he's a serious actor. He can act." Because you know, a lot of people didn't see some of the stuff like Moscow and Hudson and stuff like that. I don't think were a big hit. Mm-hmm. You know, but everybody saw Dead Poets Society. That's it. You and know, Dead Poets uh, Society and, and Goodwill Hunting were probably the top of his. Now, you know, his food chain. if we were, if this were years ago, we would be talking about Good Morning Vietnam. 
because that set people on fire. That was a virtuoso performance, which played right. That was, I think, the best ad-libbing in a successful American film where they could just let him go. That whole opening scene and that, you know, yeah, that's amazing stuff. Well, I mean, that's a, that's that's a that's a role that was pretty much custom made for him, though. Right, right. Because he's you know he's vamping you know he's 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 basing on a character that did nothing but vamp on the air every day. Right, right. You know what I mean? So that would have been perfect. Uh, well, either him or you we could have played that role. <laughs> So, uh, all right, so now let's get back. Uh, great job on him. Last time we left you, you were en route to playing the uh, uh, Beatles uh, thing up in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, I was in Danbury. It's called uh, Danbury Fields Forever, yeah. Thank you. All right, so I got them both wrong. <laughs> okay. Danbury Fields Forever. Okay, Danbury, Connecticut. So okay. now I, I kind of asked you this before you did it, but now that you did it, of course, everybody's curious, like I am. What turned out to be the most fun of doing a Beatles set that day? Like, what song did you have the most fun playing? Which one did they like the most? What was your personal performance highlight of doing a Beatles set when there had been a part of your whole life? And you have your own band, and you have your own songs, and you have all your own stuff. But you stepped into the Beatles for half an hour, 20 minutes, whatever the set. What was the highlight for you? Uh, I think without a doubt it was Come Together, which was the second song that we did. But I think we really nailed that. Everybody was pretty riveted, and we do a pretty heavy version, more, though, like the Beatles version than, than opposed to, like, say, the Aerosmith version, which I hate. But uh, I, I think that was the one that really came out. Because we, we were limited also in the songs that we could do because everybody had uh, everybody had to pick you know, so they didn't want a lot of conflict. They didn't want like 10 bands doing Twist and Shout. So if I had had a choice, you know, and I could have picked the 10 songs I want that I didn't really have that. But I did have the exclusive, uh, exclusive on Revolution and Come Together. But I think Come Together being the second track, we, you know, second song, we really were like locked up at that point. And, and it was an unusual show because um, uh, I had a lot of people on the stage that we had a couple of guest stars that came and uh, we had some people that were filling in for other people and my keyboard player wasn't on the show so it was kind of an odd lineup for me you know uh at my most comfortable you know with the lineup particular lineup i had that day it wasn't uh it wasn't thunder road you know the a team so to speak I got you. So, now tell me so, uh, we, what it is about Come Together that you like the most. What makes it a favorite of yours? From the Beatles version, what, what part of that song is it that you love? I mean, what, do you love the lyric? Do you love the riff? Or are they inseparable? Well, I just got a very, no, I don't really, you know, the lyrics are never what does it for me, but it's a very funky groove to it. You know, the Beatles, again, people don't perceive the Beatles as being funky, but that's a very funky groove on that song. You know, that, you know, and we put our own little spin on it there. You know, I throw my little notes in there and stuff like that that I do that makes it sound like us. We don't sound like the Beatles. When we, do it. we don't sound like anybody. <laughs> and we sound like us when we do it. But people right. seem to really like it. And people in the audience told me, because I asked people later on, because I was happy with some things and not happy with other things. And uh, like I said, when we, we got a couple of less than the guest stars, so we had to make room for them in songs, which meant we had to move people around from doing what they were doing. And uh, to me, I was like, mm, you know, Okay, I'll be a good guy. I won't, I won't complain. But I am, I am, uh, I am hyper, you know, uh, critical on a subatomic level. So, you are, you, know, you are, you are. But that, that's know, like the only way you can get anything good. I can't good. take the producer's hat off for, for too long. Right. Now, how was your um, weather conditions? There was no rain. Was it? Were you drenched in sweat? What, what was uh, your? No, no, it didn't. Uh, it's drizzled for about five seconds. You know, we got off the stage, and of course, it started to drizzle. Like, oh, here we go, and then it stopped. So we were, we were fine. Oh, perfect. All right. Yeah. Um, and we're Matt... doing a big outdoor uh, private event tomorrow, and we're, and we've got uh, seventy-five. You know, it's supposed to be seventy-five degrees and sunny, so that'd be. It's going to be great. Ah, so you got a gig tomorrow. Nice. Now, a private for, like, um, a nearby in uh, your... The guy that owns a construction company has a big property and has a big uh, pavilion, and uh, ah. there's going to be... Um, 
you know, we're going to play for about three hours. So Sweet. We really get to play on it. And it's going to be my A team. So I'll have Sylvia on drums. I'll have John Burke on keyboards. Oh, I have Mac on bass, and I'll have Tom Tully on vocals with me. Wow. You can do Lonely Town? We are going to do Lonely Town. You are going to do it. The only, it's, the only, it's, the only, it's the only original that we're doing. Uh-huh. Uh, but Tully's back. Tully's a big part Tully's of that back, song. Yeah. So we're doing that, but we're not doing original, mostly originals because, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, this guy has a big construction company. He's doing this for his clients and his family and friends. And so we're going to, we're going to give him the, you yeah. know, we're going to give him the Beatles and give the Give them what they want. Give them what they want. It's a party. You got like it. That. You got it. But they're also going to get Lonely Town. That's a badass song that we're he's back now. Lonely Town in there. Yeah. That's the only one we're going to do. You're the man. Yeah, you got Maybe it. Maybe the Bronx Blues. We'll see how it goes. See, See, I did, how the crowd is. It turns out I didn't even need to check. You're doing Lonely Town. Yeah, I'm just, just keeping you, just, you know, reminding you, and you're like, Ed, shut up. I know what to do. All right, listen, thank you as always. Um, you know, you, you've. And you know, people can go to our Facebook page, which is www.facebook.com slash Pat Horgan, H O R G A N, on the road. That's our Facebook page. If they want to go on and like us, that would be cool. Beautiful. Now that's three words together. Pat Horgan Thunder it's, it's Road. Pat Horgan Thunder Road. Perfect. So it's Facebook.com, Pat Horgan Thunder Road, and they can go on there and they can like us. All right, sweet. Done. Now now I got a new plug for you. All right. And then from there, anything okay. is possible. All right, man. Have right. a good weekend. Great job. Oh, so when's the gig? Tomorrow night? Uh tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow afternoon. I'll be thinking about you. All right, have a great one, man. All right. You got it. Let's Knock it. it out. There you go. And uh, Facebook. Now now we got a cool, easy Facebook plug for Pat, all right? When you need uh, Pat Horgan after he joins us on a, a day like today, it's uh, easy. You just go to uh, Facebook.com, right? Then you put Pat Horgan Thunder Road, all one handle, and you get the Facebook page. Like him like we do. All right, Pat, thanks. Bob Bell is in the wings. I saw... Um, Bob Bell's little thing. Let me turn that down, bro. Oh, he's talking again, this guy? What else is new? On this environment so that we could hear each other and so that we could get whatever information we have left out. So I, I gave you a lot of information this morning. Wanted to give you a chance to let you go over it. And then uh, we've had some questions that have been coming in to, uh, to our Twitter and so forth. So uh, we're going to address some of those. There's a question about... Uh, the timing of the re- release of the tape. So we've had this tape for a while, and uh, you know we had to diligently review the information that was in the tape, determine if there was any other reason to keep it. Uh, anybody else would be charged in the crime, and uh, we had determined that that was not going to be the case. We got a lot of uh, freedom of information requests for this tape. Um, Hi. And uh, Bob doesn't see me. at some point, it was it was just determined that we had to release it. We we didn't have good cause, absent any other reason to to not re- release it under Hi. FOI. So uh, and decided at the same time um, it wouldn't be prudent to release that information, which you know could be uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, I don't know. Hi. Well, we needed to uh, release that. At the same time, uh, we would release the uh, the name of the uh, officer who was involved in the shooting, um, so that would so that we could just keep uh, keep open and give you all the information that we have. We've pretty much given you every every bit of information that we have now. I don't think there's anything else that that uh, that we have to give out regarding the uh, second suspect who was in the store in the tape, uh, Dorian Johnson. We determined that he did not commit a crime and was not complicit in the crime. And clarifying uh, one of the other questions that came quite a bit was on uh, the role of two officers. Some some were thinking it was the same officer who handled the robbery as the as was involved in the shooting. That is not the case. Uh, there were two separate officers. This uh, this robbery does not relate to the co- initial contact between the officer and uh, um, and Michael Brown. Um, ha- having said that, I'll, I'll take a few questions. So we haven't heard any information yet, Chief, that would justify the use of deadly force, particularly outside of the car. Okay, uh, I understand that, and these are questions that, that have to go to the uh, the investigation, and I don't think anything from the investigation is going to be released until it's complete. Is it Department policy that when a weapon we, is discharged, when a weapon is discharged, is there... If the officer who 
fired the deadly shots. Um, whether he knew that Mr. Brown was involved in this incident, that, I'm confused on that. But whether he knew that Mr. Brown was involved in this incident. I, I can only go up to a certain point, and then it's... Uh...